the Neighbors Podcast. I'm your host, Allie Parsons. And on today's episode, we have Stacey Hanbury, who was Stacey Hanbury when we recorded this and then a couple weeks later got married and is now Stacey Wheel. And she is all things inspiring. She has been living a life of faith as long as I've known her. And I've known her for a very long time, since I was five years old. But she is a, was a missionary in Northern Ireland. Now she just lives there and is a resident for seven years. She is a play therapist. And we talk about the importance of relationships, how healing comes through relationships. We talk about what it's like to live in a country that's not your home country and how that's impacted her. And overall, just this resounding theme to her life of putting her yes on the table, even when it terrified her and she didn't want to do it, and what God did with that yes. It's incredible. She lives a life of faith. So I know that you're going to enjoy this conversation. Here it is, my conversation with Stacy Wheel. Stacey, welcome to the Neighbors Podcast. Thanks, Allie. I'm so glad that you're here. We go way back in life. We do. To, um, gosh, I guess I was probably five or six years old when I first met you. I think you were. I remember you and Maddie were wearing matching poinsettia dresses. <laughs> when we met? Yeah. Maddie being my sister. Um, that's hilarious. Uh, you have basically been a part of our family for a long time. Yeah. And um, we have many childhood memories together. One that came to mind when I was just thinking about having you on the podcast was, do you remember the time we disturbed the underground wasp nest? Yes. Honestly, we were just talking about that this past weekend. I remember we were hiding from friends behind a train. As then, one does. Oh, yeah. And then they completely swarmed us. We ran into my house sobbing. Yes. Our parents freaked out, threw us in the shower with all of our clothes on. Yes. But then I think we realized, like, we were hysterically crying, and then we were fine, but we couldn't, like, get out of that crying. So we were like, Ugh. We were not fine. We had, like, I remember having 15 wasp stings. Okay, maybe I got away with less, and I was uncomfortable, because <clears throat> the shower's off, right? And then all of a sudden, I'm fine. So I think the segue was like, you guys want ice cream? And our parents were going out that night to dinner. Yeah. And we had all these stings. And they put meat tenderizer on us. I do not remember and that. And they still went out to dinner. <laughs> what was They still life? left us. And I think about that so often. That's like, hilarious. Your kids run inside. They just disturbed like hundreds of wasps. We were like tearing our clothes off. Yes. I remember having so many stings. Evidently you don't. And yeah. they put meat tenderizer on us i guess that's what like was their logic and then went to dinner they're like we i'm have not to surprised they're so. like honestly we're traumatized we're gonna leave you guys with a teenage babysitter <laughs> <laughs> that's anyway awesome. that's just one of many incidents oh, from yeah. our life um meat tenderizer. but it's been so fun to just watch your journey and how you've been so faithful to God's call in your life as a missionary as a therapist just basically saying, God, what do you want me to do? And then you go, you're one of the people that just go, you go and do it. Yeah. And um, you got saved a little bit later in life. You didn't grow up in the church necessarily. Um, which can you just tell us a little bit about how you came to faith and at what age and what that what that was like for you? Yeah, um, actually your family and specifically your older sister was a huge part in me coming to know the Lord um, I did not come from a Christian home. However, I adore my family. Shout out to my family if you're listening. Um, I went to an all-girls Christian camp called Hollymont, yes. which you also attended. Go Choctaws. Um, <laughs> and I guess through Bible studies and devotions and through my leaders and many other people in my life, um, I think there's just a lot of different planted seeds until I, it was my last year as a camper at the age of 14 I was quite, kind of um, being completely drawn by the Lord at that point, and I didn't really know what was happening. People didn't teach me how to accept the Lord. And I remember sitting at my kitchen table with my family, and my dad says, you know, you seem really different. And I was like, I know. Oh, I am. I am. And he said, do you love Jesus? And I was like, I think I do. <laughs> and then I went into <clears throat> my room I was sweating and I just said, God, if you're real, I want to know you. And I had more of a radical experience getting saved because it went from like secular to me completely being hungry for God and his word sure. and the church. Like I basically lived there after that. Yeah. Also, I said you came to faith a little bit later in life and I realized 
I was 14. You were 14? <laughs> <laughs> you were very old. So old. Seasoned. Later in childhood, I should yeah, say. Yeah. Um, okay, and so then you're in high school. You're living on fire for the Lord. And you, I just remember, like, you always just had this calling towards Ireland. Yeah. And that was just, like, always something in you. Mm-hmm. Where did that come from? Like, where did that start? Yeah, I think that's really hard to explain and very, very unique So I would say that ever since I was a child, how I would explain it is my parents are travel agents. We travel all over the world. But I was always drawn to like Irish music, Ireland, looking at pictures of sheep and fields and, you know, the I know the country of Ireland, everything about it, looking at sheep. And I just told my parents, I I know that one day I'm going to live in Ireland. And then when I became a Christian, it became this thing of me pursuing mentors and asking, like, I was ready to move at 14. Then I was ready to move at 18. And many wise people around me said, you know, we can see this as a call on your life, but maybe wait until there's an actual open door. Then you'll know it's the Lord rather than me living there sure. on the streets. And, sure. you know, I don't know what my plan was. Sure. Um. So, yeah, that, that seed was planted really early in you. And then simultaneously, so you have this, like, deep-seated affinity for the Irish culture in Ireland. Yeah. And you, like, know you're going to move there. And then you also begin to see this trajectory of your life in therapy, Mm -hmm. specifically child play therapy, which I'd love for you to define what that is for us, but you start to pursue and realize God's call in your life to work in the space of child play therapy. Yeah. So um, basically for me, I think again, I'm super into seeking the wisdom of elder people who are surrounded by you. Yes. So, uh, thankfully God has always placed really wise people, really wise mentors in my life. And I think that very early on people would label me, Oh, you're great with kids. And I was like, what, you know, kids is like such a random thing. But then I started to realize I have a massive heart for children yes, you do. and I think they're super fun. It's hard for me to hang out with an adult if there's a child in the room. Yeah. <laughs> and I would say that um, I went in to get my master's in counseling I got my undergraduate in psychology only because that was the one topic that fascinated me was people and how they tick and how to love people better. So I said, if that is a profession, I'm going to launch myself into it. And then in college, I think so many people would just knock on my door to chat and I just mm-hmm. listen. I was like, maybe I just have a gift of just like being a safe person. Is there a career in that? <laughs> So then what I was the career for safe person. What is that career? Therapist. I know. And, you know, I don't think I was a skilled listener, but there's something that God had gifted me in. And I just went that way. So I the two married together of being a safe person and having a massive heart for kids, I feel like is not of me. I feel like it's very much from the Lord mm. because I recognize not everybody feels that way. Um, so then when I I had a foundations class in my master's degree. And which they introduced multiple different topics of like different types of therapy you can pursue. And they showed, I had no idea play therapy existed until they showed this one video about a girl who was in a foster care system and, you know, came from a a hard background, a hard place. And then she was introduced to play therapy. Like this child was completely broken and having these behaviors that were really scary for her new adoptive family And then through like boundaries and having like a safe boss and having a a play therapist, there were interviews of this child like a year after pursuing therapy. And she she was in the first video, pale white, you know, stone cold and like no emotion, no empathy. And then a year later, like smiling, like Mm. like red cheeks. And, you know, she'd cry at some of the stuff that she used to do to her adoptive parents. And I just thought that's me. Like that is specifically my calling. I'll do anything I can to pursue that and develop into the best like play therapist I could be. So what is the premise of play therapy? Yeah. So what is play therapy? So basically children don't speak with words typically, like linguistically, a lot of how they learn and how they heal is through play. 
So even with your own kid, you know, they're playing a lot and say if a child has a trauma, they're not going to sit there and say, oh, I feel sad today because sure. this horrible thing happened to me. They're going to act that out. They're going to play that out. And my job is to be a safe place and come alongside of that child as they play through their feelings, which ultimately leads to their healing. Mm. And it depends on what the child's coming for. Sometimes it's six sessions, sometimes it's two years. Mm. But my job is to also be that relationship for them because a lot of trauma that these kids have experienced is by a relationship. So my relationship specifically for them is for healing. Mm. So I believe, and research says that, relational trauma can be healed relationally. Yeah. So okay. a lot of what I do is giving them their favorite snacks, looking into their eyes, making sure that no matter what in the rain storms or the sunshine that they feel completely delighted in regardless yeah. of what they bring to the table or their behaviors. Which is so biblical. Like that is such a picture of God delighting in us no matter what we're walking through he's always delighting in his kids. Yeah. And that's such a picture of that. Yeah. So you pursued play therapy. You worked under one of the giants of play therapy in Nashville, Tennessee, and lived there for a while. And then you finally felt God say, okay, it's time. You're going to move to Northern Ireland. What was that whole process like? And how did that fit in with the therapy side of it too? And do you want the honest truth in all of this? Yes. Okay, <laughs> I'll give you the raw version. There's no place for honesty. Okay. We will, we will accept. Okay. Well, I think that, you know, I was in Nashville. I was working in kids ministry part-time. I was working in a private practice at Nurture House part-time. Both incredible jobs surrounded by very affluent people. Um, I got so much experience. I worked there for both for about six years. And then I remember um, being contacted by the church in Northern Ireland who was setting up, who needed a kid's pastor and a play therapist. And I was like, this is the open door. Oh, I'm completely terrified. I cannot believe this is happening, but it makes sense because I'm graduated. I'm in a place oh. where I can transition well. And I remember my boss at the time and the church was like, Stacey, I went to visit Northern Ireland to see like if I actually if it was a calling if I wanted to move there and I loved it. But when I came home, I was terrified. I was not like a cool missionary or like a cool person who moves to other countries where it's like, oh, this will be fun. I'm so easygoing. You know, well, I'll figure out when I get there. I'm actually quite like a calculated and measured person. So I was like, this is a massive risk. I'm I'm leaving everything I know, everyone I know. I'm not running from anything. Like, I'm really well established here. And I think that my boss said, Stacey, you went to Ireland six months ago. And at the time, to be honest with you, I was not spending a lot of time with God because I knew he would mm -hmm. say, yes, this is it. You were avoiding And I was like, nope. Like, <laughs> it nope. means I don't talk to him. Yeah. So I she, don't have to go. Yeah. So basically, my, my kids ministry boss said, Stacey, I've hired a, I've bought you a prayer retreat cabin an hour outside of Nashville. You're not allowed to come into work tomorrow you go pray and make a decision because we're like, we think this is a calling on your life. Wow. So I remember going out and, you know, I was in this prayer cottage. Um, I think it's called Carmel Center. If anybody's interested, it was an incredible experience. And there was a woman there and she owned the cabin. I think her name was Beans, which was hilarious. Obviously. We killed a few bugs together. And then I spent about 24 hours alone with the Lord and I said to him, you know, I'm not moving unless you give me a sign. And I'm not a huge sign person, you know, getting in the Bible with the cheap skin or whatever. I was like, I'm going to need a sign yeah. if I'm about to move my whole life. I know this is selfish of me to even ask you. And I remember being on the floor and praying for the most random sign you could ever think of because I don't really ask for those things. And I said, God, I'm going to press my iPod shuffle <laughs> and I'm begging you for the first song to be the sign. Like, it's going to be random. And I did not even know this song. One of my friends from Donegal, Ireland, had downloaded the Ring Collective Experiment album on my phone. Oh my Never gosh. listened to it. And then the song that came on was called Call to Ireland. And then the f I sometimes still get emotional because sure. I'm just thankful that he gave me that. Sure. 
But in the very first lyrics, it said to the cliffs of Antrim, which is exactly where I currently wow. live, which is exactly where the church is. And that was more than enough for me. Sure. And honestly, what I would say is after I gave God my yes, miracle after miracle after miracle kept taking place. Like, wow. you know, from the people surrounding me to, you know, I I needed a certain amount of money before I left. And it was a terrible support raiser. And I remember being like, I'm about two weeks away, maybe even a week away from jumping on that plane. And I need $10,000 more because I, I needed 14000 to leave. I only had 4000 And I remember Stressful. I was at some like event that I was leading a merch table at and this song coming on and the lyrics were, hold on to your hope as your triumph unfolds. He's in the waiting I left the merch table, got down on my knees in the front of this, just sobbing. And literally in that moment, as I'm, this is a true story. In that moment, as I'm on my knees, somebody comes up behind me, hands me a white envelope that says Ireland. I open it up. There's $10,000. Like crazy stories like that. That's probably the most significant testimony that your listeners could hear you know, if they ever feel like doing something as crazy as God has placed in my heart, that if you give him your yes, he will come through. Yeah. And sometimes it's at the last minute. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> and how powerful it is to have people in your life to keep pushing you towards the thing they can see God calling to you, even when you're resistant to it. Like, Absolutely. Left to our own devices and with the enemy, like, we will be talked out of pretty much anything. And it's so powerful when you surround yourself by people who care about God's call in your life, whether it's with them or somewhere else, pushing you towards that step of faith is just so powerful and so necessary. Yeah, there's absolutely no way I'd be where I am without this sea of people that God has surrounded me with. I, I'm incredibly thankful. Yeah. And you're one of them. Thank you. <laughs> um, so you moved to Northern Ireland, which is just, that was huge in and of itself. You say yes to being a long-term missionary. And now you've lived there for seven years. Isn't uh-huh. that crazy? It is crazy. Like, I, don't, I don't even think you can be called a missionary anymore. I think you're just, it's just. I'm just there. Just a resident. <laughs> I, I'm, um, I will be a permanent resident there in January. Incredible. Yeah. And um, you you still work for the same church that you originally said yes to, although your role has changed a little bit. So tell us what you do now, both working for the church and then what you do in the community in Northern Ireland. Yeah. So basically, I started out there working as their kids ministry person and marrying kids ministry plus play therapy has been a continual journey for me. Because when all the kids come in on a Sunday morning, I tell my leaders, you know, the most valuable thing is that every single child that leaves that room knows that they're safe, knows that they're deeply loved by every leader, plus discipleship and Mm -hmm. like making sure that they learn about the gospel because this word doesn't return void. Mm -hmm. But we get a lot of kids in our kids ministry who need help as well. Mm -hmm. And navigating that um, is actually very, very fun. Um, But what I would say is how my role has changed. So basically in Northern Ireland, there is a huge divide between Catholics and Protestants and how I would probably label that is um, just segregation between the two. And it's more like you're born Catholic or Protestant. It's more about that than it is that you're a church going Catholic Mm. or church going Protestant. So I started realizing that and realizing, oh my gosh, how do I bring the kingdom of God to this specific community while holding arms and hands with my church? And a huge, huge thing that we're passionate about is unity amongst believers and reaching the lost. So I specifically have started doing these events in estates, which would be kind of like projects here, going and basically like bringing football cages and bubble machines and all these different things. Football, where, she means soccer. Yeah, soccer. She's so, full European. Now. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so basically going into loads of different estates and just blessing the estate rather than trying to make them feel like they have to come to our church. Right. Or we'll do massive events called like the Easter egg drop where 3,000 people from Antrim will come and we just like do a big event for. So Mm. Journey is specifically known for doing community events just to bless the community. 
And that's something I'm hugely a part of. And a lot of what I do as well is now that we have our own building, we open up the building for the community by doing different events like movie nights or karaoke. So after we do outreaches, they know us and they feel welcome to walk into a church and feel safe and not feel like they're going to be bombarded Mm -hmm. with any specific material. So I suppose through that, loads of families who have been marred or traumatized by religion have an incredible example of a community that just truly and authentically wants to love them. And if they happen to come to know the Lord through that, it's a massive bonus. Mm. And so I do that. And then also other things that I do is um, obviously play therapy and the types of kids I work with it would be quite radically different because I I would work with a lot of kids whose parents were traumatized by the troubles and therefore like they kind of bring that trauma into the family. Can you tell us what the troubles are? Yeah. So basically like 1960s through 1990s, there was a lot of, well, it was a civil war in Belfast, which is actually where my fiance currently lives and where I work part time. Um, So basically there was a big civil war between Catholics and Protestants there's a lot of bombing. There's a lot of shooting. There's a lot of the British Army who came in. And people were just shot and killed at point blank. Mm-hmm. I met a woman on the beach here in Jacksonville who was from Belfast the other day. And she was like, I'm a child of the Troubles, mm-hmm. you know. They, it's like some part of their life. Oh, yeah. Way. And she talked to us about it for about an hour or two just because they want their stories to be heard. Mm-hmm. And it's really wild to be a child of the Troubles and to say, I didn't know walking back from school if I would make it because a bomb went off right next wow, to me. Yeah. And they just, from her own words, they just had to get used to it. So the I, people right now in their 40s, 50s, 60s are, are children of the Troubles. And so that therefore they're mm. having children and it's second generation trauma, but it's still very, very recent and sure. very much in the culture So we're still coming out of that. And a lot of what I do is bring family restoration and reconciliation by not only working with the children's children, like not only working with the parents' children from the troubles, but by putting my arms around parents who have walked Mm -hmm. through that and helping them heal while helping repair the relationship between the child and the parent. If the parent wasn't available to parent well because of the trauma that they brought in. And you told me what's the wait list for these kids to be able to see you? Currently right now in all three different practices, I'd say easily 184. Which is heartbreaking. Like this is a huge need. And I mean, it's a need in our country too. And it's so powerful. You know, the the enemy would love nothing more than to tear the family apart because if he can tear the nuclear family apart, there's just so much division and so much ground he can take because the family represents so much. And so it probably, or I know it freaks the enemy out to reconcile and repair and heal whole family units. So it's just incredible work that you're doing. And I want to say back to the community events that you do, unity in the church. I mean, that is, that translates to any context and culture And I think it's really important for people to hear, like, we are not in the competitive church market. Like, whether there's a church down the street or a ministry, there should be no reason for competition. We're just here for unity and to love people and to show them that the church is a place that they can be safe and meet real freedom. And I think that's just so beautiful that that's your approach and your church's approach in that community is let's just wrap arms around people because we're just all people and let's just wrap arms around and let them know our building is safe and there might be other churches that are safe and great places we just want them to get plugged in no matter where they are you know exactly and I love that and obviously I'm learning a lot from my own church leadership in that being an American yeah but I agree church unity and I also agree like with what you're saying about family breakdown I think like Malachi 4, 6 talks about like turning the hearts of the children back to the parents and the parents back to the children. Mm. So a lot of what I would do in the playroom is between a parent and a child if there's been some sort of breakdown, because I completely agree with you, even when scripture talks about, you know, 
they will know us like Christians by the way that we love one another. And I personally feel that the most powerful weapon in the kingdom are happy, healthy, whole families. Mm -hmm. And sometimes things outside of families will affect them and bring in some sort of breakdown, which is what the enemy would love. Mm -hmm. So I'm super passionate about healthy whole families and it feels like the greatest, most spectacular line of work. Yeah, for sure. So are there still, you've lived in Northern Ireland for seven years now. You're about to get married, which is so exciting. We're so excited for you. And are there, what are the hard things about living in another country that you're not, you weren't born in, your family still all lives in Jacksonville, Florida. Yeah. What are still some things that you find yourself facing that are still a challenge to that reality? Yeah, I would say that I'm a Florida girl born and raised. I literally have an orange slice on my arm for Florida. Shout out to all Floridians. So in my heart and soul, I'm literally in this country that is constantly raining, constantly dark. Very different from Florida. The winter hours are, you know, the sun gets up at 10 a.m., goes down at 4 p.m. And at that point, I'm by a fireplace from 4 until the next morning. I would say that that's difficult. The the weather's difficult. And then I adore my family. So not being able to see them Mm -hmm. and not being able to see my niece and nephew has definitely been a massive sacrifice. I would say, you know, you're asking about the hard things. Um, I'm thankful that there's not too many hard things because I love and I feel like God's given me the grace to live there. But another one is I love sushi. I literally love sushi. I love Chick-fil-A. I love sweet tea. So a lot of the things that I crave, I'm sure I gain like 15 to 20 pounds when I'm here because we're constantly like (laughs) eating. We had lobster macaroni and cheese the other day and I, you know, took a nap after. I would say definitely the weather, the food and my family are the things that are really difficult. But I'm thankful because my parents are travel agents and they actually... Um, their hottest line of work right now happens to be in Northern Ireland. Of course. So they're it, coming in October. Isn't it funny to look back and you see God building your reality brick by brick? Just the fact that your parents are travel agents and everything. I remember you had some visa troubles and, I mean, just stuff with flights. And when COVID happened and Northern Ireland was really shut down in, during COVID, but your parents have friends in high places and are so familiar with the travel world. It's just, I love when God shows up in that way that for decades, he was preparing the ground for you to be a successful international missionary living internationally from your family and your home country. And it's just funny to look back on and see like, oh, he was preparing it from the start. Yeah. And I think that's like been the most encouraging thing is that I can look back and say, oh my gosh, God was working the whole time. And then he's kept me there. And more than anything, I think I went into the country and was like, I'm going to be this incredible missionary and I'm going to bless this place. But I think equally as much, that culture has really taught me a lot and has healed me in these big ways. And I've been so surrounded there. And so, you know, I've learned so much from them. Like, they're harder to know. Like They're harder to get to know. Americans, I think it's like, Ali, you're amazing. We just met. Be my best friend. Yeah, yeah. But because of the troubles, it takes them longer to build relationships there. So it took me about a year, a year and a half to make even a single friend. and th- Which was hard for you because you have historically made friends very easily, even regardless of American culture. You're just that person that makes friends with everybody. Yeah. So then God, I mean, literally led you through a season of a year, year and a half to make a close friend. Being a loser (laughs) and knocking at people's doors for friendship. But I would say that after a year and a half, um, you know, after seven years, they, I feel so deeply connected to that Mm. culture and the people. They say, you're ours now, which sounds strange, but it it means so much to me that they... You know, they'll have me over for dinner every night for uh, we'll stay up late hours by the fireplace, like drinking a glass of wine. Sure. So the culture there's taught me a lot about family connection, valuing relationships before yeah. all things, even professionalism. So I think that whenever friends come and visit or family, they're like, I understand why you stay here. Mm. You, the, the people here are incredible. Yeah. And that's such a heartbeat of 
missions too. Like we can so easily fall into, let me bring my full American self to this culture and bless them and bring all my skills. And then God ends up revealing like, no, actually the beauty of it is their culture getting all over you and you learning the beauty of this other culture and how that can change you as a person and, and expand your perspectives and your traditions and all that. So it's really beautiful. Absolutely. And I think that like the American side of things though, that I had brought to them, no doubt, like I bring fun and spontaneity and vulnerability and honesty and all these things that it's like, you know, like we're teaching each other, but yeah, Yeah, I would say definitely walking away They're they're massive host culture. So if you ever come over, you'll have a place. I know we got to come. I know we have having a baby. So we're missing your wedding sadly, but, um, okay. Last question that I ask everybody is what is something outside of, cause you work a lot, you work like six plus days a week outside of play therapy and the church and all that. What is something for fun that you're just loving right now? Outside of wedding planning and all of that, I would say that I have a ragdoll cat named Mushu. I accidentally bought him off Gumtree thinking he was a normal cat. He was about $900. I literally did not know how to buy a cat. What is Gumtree? So Gumtree is like eBay. In Northern Ireland. Yes. And so. You bought a cat. I bought a you cat. Bought a $900 cat. cat. Well, to be fair, my p- parents bought me a, for a birthday present. On eBay, basically. On eBay. I picked him up about an hour away, brought him into my house, did not know it was a ragdoll pedigree. I thought I was getting something that could take care of itself. Turns out he's Wait, what super is a needy. Ragdoll? Taylor Swift knows. She's got the same exact She's cat. Listening. She's a pe- <laughs> Taylor Swift. Taylor Swift I'll speak knows. on behalf of both of us since we're <laughs> such close friends. Um, he basically is white and gorgeous. People visit Mushu more than me. Um, Mushu. thankfully my fiance, yeah, I did after the dragon and Mulan, but I would say that he brings me a lot of joy because he's actually really needy. Like he's constantly on top of me. Meows consistently is not allowed outside, but is a drama queen and escape artist. So he's constantly escaping and the whole neighborhood has to look for him. Oh it's become this like nightly tradition of like, oh my gosh, Mushu's missing. <laughs> and then we all have to terrible. find them. And he's like, he doesn't know how to get very far. So he's typically like in the neighbor's boat or like rolling around in a bush. But I would say that he brings me a lot of joy. And I'm learning how to uh, cook in a crock pot, like a slow cooker. Oh, yeah. So, like, my friends and I have a culture night every Wednesday night. So we go to different countries every Wednesday. Very fun. So, yeah. That's probably the thing that I love the most. Amazing. Well, Stacey, I'm so proud of you. And your story is just constantly, whether it was hard or easy, putting your yes on the table. You live your life for the glory of God. Everybody who knows you knows that. And there are, I am confident that when we get to heaven, there will be so many faces who say, I am here because Stacy told me about Jesus. And that is so inspiring to me and so inspiring to everyone else. So thank you so much for well, being thanks here. Thanks for having me. <laughs> and happy wedding. Thanks. <laughs> Dang. Neighbors is produced by Logger Creative and Taylor Minning. Music by Austin and Lindsay Adamak, artwork by Wesley Parsons, and motion graphics by Robbie Burns.